The title of this presentation should actually be Birding Your Way. This is just a story of myself and a bit of my journey through bird watching. And I want everybody to think about themselves throughout this. It's not selfish to do so. I want you to think about your own personal needs, the things you want in life, and the opportunities you might have to give back. And right off the bat, that mouse is in a weird spot, so I don't think it's advancing. Let's see. Oh, there we go. And that, of course, leaves us with a cursor in the middle of my presentation. So I want to take you back a couple of years. The pandemic has been raging. Vaccines have made their way into the populace. It's September 11th, a bit of an auspicious date, but unrelated to very past events. I set my alarm nice and early. I got up in the dark, got dressed, got downstairs, pulled out the Starbucks app, just as I did this morning, in order to trench a black iced tea with two pumps of classic. That's my drink, and it's sitting right on the side of this podium right now. Breakfast sandwich and pastry, and I got on the road. I drove in the dark, in the quiet, south, and I pulled up to a metal gate. I opened that gate and drove in. I could hear the red-winged blackbirds and the starlings calling. Closed the gate behind me because it's pre-gate time, multiple hours before gate time. I got in the parking lot, I got all my gear, and I set up on a hillside just outside this door. I was going to do a sky watch for the first time in quite a while. Let's see if this going to go. As the sun started to come up, I could see a glow coming off the river. It was 45 degrees, kind of like this morning, though it was colder this morning. The river was still warm, and it lit up orange. It was like the entire river valley was on fire. A few minutes later, an olive-sided flycatcher started hunting in the morning and set up against the sunlight. I got my camera out, and I forgot. I forgot how difficult the last couple of years had been. I birded for six hours, almost never moving from that one spot, because I didn't want it to end. So this day was an interesting response. It was an answer to a question. And I asked myself, what was my best day bird watching? Now, a lot of you that know me know that I've seen a lot of birds. I bird watch a lot. I've presently bird watched over 1,100 straight days in a row. And I do not plan to stop. But this particular day was different. Now, I do apologize. We're going to get into a, a really brief moment of psychology. I started to realize <laughs> that that day represented a day where I was finally meeting all of my needs. We all have physiological needs, and I'll get off this really quickly, I do promise. We all have needs for air, food, water, but we have needs for safety. The pandemic had the tendency to erode that safety. And the more our base requirements and needs are not being met, the harder it is to meet these needs. That day for me represented a day where my needs were being met in these higher tiers finally, or once again. So I want you to keep that in mind as I talk today, your needs. What is it you need from bird watching? What is it you need in general? And what is it that you want? And we'll talk about the differences soon. So I want to take you back to better days. <coughs> I want this to be slightly uplifting, if at all possible. 
instead of an emotional trip for me. <laughs> this is Blue Mountain State Park. So I asked myself further questions. Okay, Ben, don't get hung up on the mid-pandemic, post-pandemic birding experience. What sticks out in your mind? If you ask yourself the question, what is your best days? What is the best moment to happen to you in bird watching? This was the next one up, Blue Mountain State Park. In advance of this hike, I had no idea this rock quarry even existed. I started in a parking lot with a prairie with a buffalo paddock. I just started hiking. 10 miles and six and a half hours later in the wettest feet I have ever had in my life, came back to the parking lot with 86 species of birds and the most phenomenal moments of my entire life, at least as far as the ones I held privately. I started in a parking lot that was empty and I ended in a parking lot that was empty. I had hundreds and hundreds of acres of land to myself and I saw this and you can see it on my face, you can see the smile on my face. I was in my element, I was doing what I was meant to do. Every bird I saw that day was not previously reported. Nobody had been there yet this year. I didn't look at eBird reports, I just went and experienced it. Within nine days of that moment, the next one that came to mind was Grand Portage State Park. Just on the other side of High Falls here is Canada. I went from the southwest corner, that Blue Mountain is in Rock County, it's almost in the Dakotas and Iowa. Nine days later, and 87 miles of hiking later, in roughly 15 state parks, I did this one. Four and a half miles, three and a half hours, 31 species, it was like going back in time. It was cold up there. It was rainy and chilly in the southwest, but it was really cold up there. Going to Middle Falls, gained and lost about a thousand feet of elevation. And as I told my wife about it, for some reason that I cannot identify, I put all of my gear away when I got to Middle Falls after taking pictures, and I started to run. Running was one of my favorite things to do, but my body started to fail me, and I couldn't. But on that day, I did. I'm a little more of a sandhill crane, as we talked about right beforehand, <laughs> but I felt like a wolf that day. That might be a little bit of hyperbole, but I just literally felt like running in the woods that day. And it was wonderful. There were no pre-planned birds, there were no chases. It was just me in the park. Big Bog State Recreational Area has a one mile elevated, high quality bog walk. It existed before all the Saxon bog board walks and stuff they put in. One mile out, one mile back. It doesn't take me two and a half hours to cover that kind of distance. <laughs> But in this instance, in this case, I walked into the most alien environment I'd ever seen in my life, and I didn't want to leave. It was amazing, it was beautiful, it was different, it was new. And then there was this, and that, and that. This is a trail. This is the Challenge Trail at LaSalle Lake SRA, State Recreational Area up in Hubbard County. I saved it. I prepared for it. I bird watched, but I needed to hike. This is the lake itself, and the trail extends all the way around this entire lake. The DNR website says caution. There's a couple of water crossings, and there are no bridges. Be prepared and come for a long hike. Eight and a half miles and four and a half hours, 35 species later, including a spruce grouse at the southern edge of its range. I'd had the most amazing and beautiful time I could possibly imagine for myself. Now in truth, if you look it up, it is not an eight and a half mile trail, I'll just say this right now. I prepared for everything except my own incompetence. <laughs> At a critical point early on in the trail system, it looked like an actual trail to the right, and I went off to the right. I knew I was off course when I found a road. <coughs> I was on a forest road and had no idea. 
a mile and a quarter up. Here I was at that ultimate journey, that ultimate point, and I was a mile and a half, mile and a quarter off road. I turned around and I said, oh, I'm not failing this adventure. I gotta get back to the start and I'm gonna have to really put the throttle down. On my way back, a pileated woodpecker laughed at me. <laughs> I marked him down on the list and said, I hear you. <laughs> and I got back on the trail. Now, those were just moments that came to my mind. Best moments birding. And you might think to yourself, well, that's just a bunch of hiking, and then you happen to record birds along the way, and that would be a true statement. If I force myself to answer the question, what are the best birds, individuals that you've seen, I invariably come back to the same thing every time. A Ross's gull that showed up just down the river at Point Douglas down here that I found was one of the rarest gulls in North America. I heard word after three days of this bird being present that somebody flew from Arizona to see it. There are birders that will spend 50, 60, 70 years never seeing this species and it showed up a stone's throw or a gull's flight away from this property and most likely had to fly directly over this property. A blue grosbeak my friend Peter Nichols and I found as a first county record in Washington County. We targeted that specific bird and found it in 45 minutes from the beginning of our endeavor. A red-throated loon I just found this last fall with my wife at Afton Marina just up the river was also a first county Washington record. A Says Phoebe just a week ago at Grey Cloud Dunes SNA at the southern edge of this county. That's a second county record. The first county record found by one of our guides today, Rick Schmidt, just back here, just last year. Even and a of blind course, pig finds an acorn every once in a while. what's that? Even a blind pig finds an acorn every once in a while. That's what I was thinking too. That was, it was Rick's welcome to the county. Rick moved into the area and then suddenly just starts dropping uh, bombs on us for uh, birds, including a lark bunting as well. Just absolute insanity. And the Eurasian widgeon. I found a Eurasian widgeon at Lake Billsby two weeks after I bought my first spotting scope. It was my justification for spending $1,500 on a spotting scope. <clears throat> so all of these have something in common as well. These are personal finds. Nothing in my head offered up a bird that I chased. Now I'm not gonna spend the entire day talking down to chasing. Chasing has value. I will continue to chase. I will probably always chase. But these, and those hiking adventures with birding say something about me. For anybody that is a fan of movies, this is Keanu Reeves in the movie The Matrix. He's in the Oracle's kitchen, and there's a Latin phrase above the door that is referenced in the movie. It says, temet noske, know thyself. I do think about this often. How well do I know myself? How well do I know what my needs are? <clears throat> How well do I know what my wants are? In my youth, I wanted records. When I was in high school, all the way back in 94, in 1993 I set the school record in the high jump at 6 feet 6 inches, so roughly my own head. In college, I set my sights on that school record and broke it by the time I was a junior as well, just over seven feet. So I'd be jumping over something about this high. But why? Why was this a thing for me? It was a thing for me because I was a younger brother. My older brother's actually in the audience. He was a superior physical athlete in high school. And I was in the shadow. One of my needs that I've known my entire life is that I do not like to blend in. <laughs> Nobody my height likes to blend in unless they don't like being tall. I like to stand out. So what does that mean from a bird watching standpoint? A want, in my opinion, is a goal. A goal is nothing more than a summarization whether you think about it or not, of your needs. At the time, I needed to break records, but I actually wanted to break records. What I needed is to have an identity, a sense of self, 
a way to stand out, and a standing in that group, a group of my peers. When we look at bird watching, one thing that I have found is that it's very easy within the birding community to misalign our wants and our needs. Now, the reason why I feel that way, personally, is because of chasing. A chase is a required activity. It limits volition, your ability to direct your own life. So if you set a want and you say, I want to see as many bird species as possible, the fastest path to doing that is getting on social media and following absolutely every report possible. And if you act like a human computer sometimes, I'm not pointing any fingers or anything, then you have the tendency to overindulge. You make everything about getting the next bird and not about enjoying yourself. I was chasing, and I was chasing hard. Now, don't get me wrong, seeing a beautiful singular species that somebody else found, it's a shot of adrenaline. Your endorphins go up, you enjoy the moment, so then you hit the next one. But in the meantime, what's happening, if we think back to the little psychology test on the second slide, the little pyramid there, it starts to erode some of your other needs. I no longer had volition, I didn't have control. I like to control things, I'm a bit of a control freak. I can't do that at work necessarily, so I do it in my personal life. But I ceded all of that control. The eBird Top 100 list, if anybody's familiar with it, is both the best and worst thing to ever happen to birding in my opinion. <laughs> Why? Because I'm just as likely to sit out there and look at Dakota County and stare at Matthew Thompson in the back corner and say, Matthew's at the top, do I have to beat that? Do I need to be better? What is that what better is? Is that what the definition is? And I realized all I was doing, this is me personally, was I was transferring athletics to birding. But those two don't work very well together because birding is a completely different animal. Another thing people will find about me is that I truly enjoy going down the rabbit hole. I am Alice. How many people create spreadsheets for bird watching constantly? There's a few and I see you. <laughs> There's a certain type of person that needs that level of information, that level of knowledge. I need to go down the rabbit hole. And what I was finding is chasing exclusively was short-circuiting my learning process, my ability to gain more knowledge. I love being an oracle. I love to be able to stand up here and talk ad nauseum about things that I feel like I've mastered. Volition being eliminated. That is critical factor in all of that. So what did I do? I changed my approach. I made up a new game. You saw it at the beginning. I found new opportunities, as Kevin mentioned, to create goals that gave me permission to not do what everybody else was doing. And I say everybody else in a very generalized sense because everybody is doing what they need to do or I hope they are needing to do. I had desires and aspirations. I've been writing them down in notes. Not only are there spreadsheets, there are Word documents every single year for the last decade with goals, ideas, start a YouTube channel that does X, start a birding club that does Y, create media, write a book, all of those things are really hard to do if I spend all of my time going to get someone else's birds. It was breaking my ability to do what I wanted to do. It was breaking my ability to hit the peak of that pyramid, self-actualization. Reaching my full potential, reaching our full potential. So you saw a whole bunch of them at the beginning. In 2018, as I came out of 2017, I needed that change, and I made it. I had gone to a presentation by Mervac for Robert Jansen, Bob Jansen, one of the most legendary birders in the state. That presentation was on his book that he did in collaboration with the DNR, Birds of Minnesota State Parks. When I got this, it was a key. 
It unlocked something in me. There was a whole new book of mysteries, unknowns. I was aware that the birding world didn't go seven miles off a parking lot to find birds. Most of them went the easy route. Go to easy birds, on the roadside, get out, record it, and then leave. My first version of this goal was in 2016, and it just said state parks, three-year plan with a question mark. A couple of years later, I said, I think I can do better than that. I plotted it out. I talked with my wife, and I said, this is going to be crazy, but I think I can do them in one year. 74 plus properties in one year. This is just a selection of the selfies I took. I don't like taking my own picture. I don't like my picture being taken. And I changed the game. I was now proud of what I was doing. I was excited. I was discovering. I had adventures. I did every one of these parks by myself. I found purpose, solitude, adventure. I didn't have a bug shirt on here at Big Bog. I came prepared. I did everything that I needed to do. I did research, created spreadsheets, drafted routes, you name it. There's only one problem with this goal. Some of you might guess it if you know me. It only took seven months. <laughs> I went to 74 state parks in seven months. In that one span, as I noted, I was at uh, Blue Mountain State Park in the southwest. I hit 12 to 15 state parks, saw 20 plus waterfalls, hiked 87 miles. I was unstoppable. Because I was doing what I was meant to do. And I was creating presentations that I could deliver to others. I could talk to people. I could inspire others to get involved and to find their joy. So seven hit July, it's a lot of time to think for next year. I needed something that would really challenge me. I was up for it, and I created more spreadsheets than you can possibly imagine, and I created more maps than you can possibly imagine. These in the background are months. January, May in the lower left corner, and what these represent is every GPS location of an eBird checklist that I submitted from my phone. I imported them into individual layers. I'm a bit of a tech geek, so I figured out how to do this stuff and created this. And this is eight months worth. This is the entire year. 2019, one year. 3,180 checklists. This map is not the same map. This is how I did it, at least part of how I did it. I created a Google map with 10 layers and 10,000 plus map objects. I had friends in the DNR that sent me KML files those are GPS locators for all the state properties you could possibly imagine. WMAs, WPAs, SNAs, the state trails, state parks, <coughs> bolt launches, county boundaries, anything I could get that would give me a leg up in spaces I had never been to before. I spent three months in research at the kitchen table. My wife can attest, I would spend hours at the table pouring over data to prepare to go bird watching instead of actually bird watching. Why? Because it brought me joy. It's what I needed, and I wanted to be successful. I don't like losing. Cindy will recognize this, and so will Kevin Smith. At the completion of my goal, we have a little ceremony out here on our annual migratory bird watch. And I got my 10,000 cupcakes. So 10,000 county ticks was my goal. If anybody wants a definition of a county tick, if you came in the driveway today and you saw a chickadee, that is one. One in Washington County. You can get chickadee in Dakota County for two. You can get it in Goodhue County for three. You can get 87 of those for any given one species. 
and then start adding other species in and aggregate all of that across 87 different counties and you can count to 10,000. It is as daunting as it sounds, but I broke it down, tried not to panic, and I did something different than the previous year. I engaged others. I got help. 7,752 of the 10,000 ticks occurred with other people. Every single one of my birding lists from 2018 was solo. It was a different game, and it was an opportunity to get in touch with friends and people I hadn't met and bird with others and learn something new, to add something to my background and my knowledge. By the end of the year, all 87 counties were at 100 species or more. So the minimum number was 100 species in every one of the 87 counties. I saw 16 different species in all 87 counties. In the birding world, in the uh, listing world, that's called a stack, like a hefty cinch stack of birds. So 87 uh, of each of those 16 and four species, I was just one county short. It was hard to keep track of everything on Earth. I tried my best, a little bit like data from Star Trek. My best day for county touches was with my friend Liz. We did the Kitson County run northwest corner, about seven hours from here. We got to Kitson County and back in one day and recorded birds in 16 different counties in the process. This one down here is probably one of the more fun ones. I pulled out a lot of stats and had to drop a lot of them. 71 sewage bonds in one year. <laughs> Only a truly mad person goes to 71 <laughs> sewage bonds intentionally in a year. And it was glorious. It truly was. It was the pinnacle of achievement for me. I view this as proudly what I've done here and the ability to talk about it and potentially inspire other people. I view it the same way that I view those high jump records that I still think about in the past. I want them to be broken. I want somebody to come up and say, I can do you one up. Let's see it. Let's do it. I'll help you. So all of this arcs around in an attempt to get us somewhere. And that somewhere is the purpose of this festival. <coughs> All of that stuff sounds initially very self-centered. And to a degree it is. Because I honestly believe, after having gone through the pandemic, after having seen what it did to me personally, what it did to people I care about personally, we need to take care of our needs, our emotional needs. You need to take care of yourself. Now the interesting thing about bird watching to me is that it is a hobby that has an interesting secret. From day one, my very first birding effort within Minnesota, I did something. I recorded it. And I did so on my cell phone with the precursor to the eBird app. I believe it was called Bird Log at the time. And then Cornell picked up the code base and they started to develop the app further. So the eBird on their about has this statement in it. A lot of people may not think about their eBird data this way, or perhaps even their MOU data this way, but the data does something that a lot of hobbies don't do just by exercising the hobby itself. And that is it donates to science. So the very act of doing the thing that we enjoy gives back. It is a start point for those of us that are not used to doing so. I grew up in a relatively poor household. We didn't have a lot, but our parents did the best that they could. And we got into sports. We were busy. And I stayed an athlete all the way through college. A lot of individuals find giving and volunteering through their church. We didn't go that route. So there wasn't a lot of volunteering built into my DNA, built into my thought process. eBird started to change that, and that was interesting to me. The idea that just this last year, because I need birding to be a consistent part of my life, 
I submitted enough complete checklists on eBird to be in the top 30 on planet Earth. <laughs> now, I'm not making this up. I get up in the morning, I eat breakfast, <coughs> and I complete a bird list. I start work in my home office, and I complete a bird list. 45 minutes later, when the birds are truly awake, I complete a bird list. It's a checkpoint. It gets me in a certain flow and mental state throughout the day. And when the day is up, it doesn't matter what the weather is. I don't care if it's raining, snowing, or whatever it is. I'm going for a hike. I'm an athlete. I need outdoor time, and I complete checklists. Most days, 10 to 12 per day at this point. Maybe that will calm down after a while, but that's what happens. So I found that there is actually a progression, there is a pattern. I spend my life watching birds and looking for patterns in the birds, and there's a pattern in my life as well, and I want everyone to be aware of it. I think there's value in understanding that when we get used to the idea of giving our data away to charity, in a sense, to a nonprofit, to an educational institution that is building data models and things of that sort, we are already engaging in a giving process. There are very similar parallels within the birding space. Breeding bird atlas routes, Christmas bird counts that the Audubon sponsors and has for over a hundred years. There's calls and requests for people to do bluebird house monitoring. It doesn't take an infinite amount of experience to monitor bluebird houses. I have two in my yard. You check on it, make sure nothing is going awry, and then leave it alone. And you check those routes during the breeding season, you clean them out when you're done, decommission them for the winter, bring them back online in the spring. Special survey efforts. I had an opportunity, the MOU listserv, one of the most archaic communication methodologies still known to man, but it works, sends out an email to everybody that gets a message. Several years ago, a message went out and said, we need surveyors for the Browns Creek Watershed District. It crosses the Gateway State and Browns Creek State Trails here in Washington County. They needed surveyors because they needed to know the wildlife makeup on that property. So I volunteered. One weekend a month for 12 months. So you mean to tell me I can volunteer and all I have to do is bird watch? Well, that's easy. I was going to do that anyway. You're just telling me I have to go to the Gateway State Trail. Fine, I've never been there before. Sounds like an adventure. Bird banding operations. Now, this is where I, I, I want to make a point. Not everything is for everyone. I have been asked at this property for my interest in helping bird banding. I wish that I could. Bird banding is not me. I don't like to touch the birds. I like to see them know that they're wild and doing their thing, and I don't want to restrain them. I kind of feel like a Yeti sometimes if it's not obvious from my makeup. <laughs> and I just, I don't like something that vulnerable in my hands. I like it to be doing its own thing. But it doesn't mean that science isn't important. Guide work for events and festivals like this one here. This is where I want to just hit a quick story. Now, of course, these have been all stories on here, but this is important, and it's actually a message for those that organize and are already volunteering, because I think this is important. I think this is a critical point. I made the note about my childhood, the idea that I didn't have it in my head to volunteer. That wasn't <coughs> that I didn't have it in me to volunteer, it's just that I didn't think I was good <coughs> enough. I spend most of my life believing that everyone else I run into is probably better than me at something, and it makes me work several times harder to make sure that might not be true, because I don't like to be a shadow. I like to stand out front. So when it came to about seven, I guess it's almost nine years ago at this point. When I came to Minnesota and started bird watching, I wanted to get into the community. And the way that I did that was an MOU field trip. And I don't know if he remembers this or not. It was with Kevin Smith at Neesville Ravine. 
That was within just months of me picking up bird watching. I latched on to Kevin's coattails pretty hard because I recognized skill. He had a great disposition, and I truly enjoyed being around him. Now, here's a gentleman close, if not already at his retirement age. I'm, you know, a decade or so behind him, and birding is the great equalizer. I birded with Matthew Thompson. I birded with him when he wasn't even out of high school yet. But I've also birded with individuals in their late 80s. It is an equalizer. So in this particular case, a following year, Kevin was going to do that trip, and I couldn't make it. And I reached out to him. I said, Kevin, do you want to do a survey? Do you want to do that in advance, like a week before, and check it out and see how it's going? I need an excuse to birdwatch with Kevin Smith. He said, yeah, we could do that. I don't know if he wanted to or not, but he was so kind, I don't think he would say no. <laughs> not too much later, <clears throat> Kevin was recruiting for this event. And he asked me directly, Ben, would you be interested in being one of our guides? And I was like, do you think I'm good enough? I, do I, I don't know if I have that kind of skill. I don't know if I can do that. And he said, oh, you're fine. You're going to be great. We could really use you. We like your enthusiasm. We want you to be a part of the event. That was the trigger for me. I needed somebody. That is the message for you that get others to volunteer is to give quality contact to the other people. If you respect somebody, you like what they do, you like their attitude, their approach, whatever it might be, tell them and invite them into your world. And then for all of you that are prospective volunteers, individuals, you do have what it takes. There is an opportunity for everybody. Find your opportunities. I have an article coming out in two weeks in the Minnesota Birding Newsletter. I've been writing now for seven years for the newsletter and other publications. I have been presenting, doing the things that I'm meant to do, volunteering in the way that I can to use my voice to get to others. And in some situations, as Jen Veith will tell you, I will even do technology-related things if it push comes to shove. I like to keep work where work is, and Jen knows that, but she also knows that if life is on the line, she can call on me. And that was the modus operation here on site. This is radio telemetry. This is using a bunch of hacked together devices from the internet, basically a Raspberry Pi computer and a couple of weird fun cute dongles that come from Europe with a flash system on them that had to be reflashed. And I had to work through the technology. And they got in a tough spot because they lost their intern. And we got them up and running. And it took some work. I don't like doing technology work instead of bird watching. I like the eight hours to be at the office with Mike, and then we're done. <laughs> so as I wrap up, this quote came to mind, and it doesn't quite work because it says something about a job in there. But it works for birding and it works for volunteering, it works for getting involved. If you find the thing you enjoy doing, you will never work a day in your life. I spent about 25 to 40 hours working on and thinking about this presentation. I did a shorebird presentation for the MOU Spring Primer and then reprised it in one hour version a week later, just these last two weeks. And I spent 40 hours building that presentation. And I did a presentation earlier this year for the St. Croix Birding Club over in River Falls in the library, and I spent 15 or 20 hours on that presentation. And I spent 10 or 12 hours writing my article for the Minnesota Birding Newsletter. This year I have volunteered more in one year than I've ever volunteered in my life. I see it continuing. I enjoy the process. It surprised me, to be completely honest. But if you find balance, you find the things you're meant to do that you enjoy doing, make birding what you need it to be. If you need to chase birds in what little amount of spare time you have, then chase birds with everything you've got. If you need adventure, though, find that adventure. Plan your adventures. Do what you need to do and don't apologize for it. Save the environment. We need it. Let's go find some birds. Mm -hmm.